It's not something that we typically like to think of having an enormous impact on our lives, but what science is beginning to realize is that it really does affect the way that we live day to day, and that it's actually a lot harder to stay in the moment than we'd like to think. So, in 2010, two Harvard researchers conduct, uh, created an app called Track Your Happiness as a way to assess the way that our moment-to-moment -moment experiences could impact our overall happiness levels. Users would go about their normal days, and then the app, the app would signal random check-ins, asking people what they were currently doing, their mood, and whether or not they were fully focused on the present, or if their mind was wandering. And so, after collecting data from over 655,000 reports from people all over the world, what they realized was that virtually everybody's minds wandered, and that they wandered a lot. So, depending on the activity, people reported being more or less focused, but still, overall, 47% of the time that people were awake, they were thinking about something other than the current activity they were taking part in. And, in a sense, this is a good thing. You know, the ability for our minds to stray and think about something other than the present allows humans to learn, plan, and reason pretty much unlike any other species. Also, our narrow attention span protects us from sensory overload, from the billions of sensations that we're hit with every day. But, there's also a negative to all this, which oftentimes is overlooked. So, going back to the happiness study, one of the other things that they found was this overwhelming correlation between mind wandering and unhappiness. Regardless if people reported that their mind was wandering to unpleasant, neutral, or even pleasant thoughts, they still were substantially less happy than when they were fully focused on the present. Also, the more that our minds wander, the more we lose focus on the present, which could be an issue if we're doing something important, kind of like zoning out in class. And then lastly, the more that we lose focus on the present, the more prone we become to make mistakes. And just one example of how dangerous this can be would be with distracted driving. So an assessment of all the fatal vehicle crashes that took place between 2010 and 2011 ruled 62% of all distracted driving deaths specifically to daydreaming, which ended up being five times the amount of deaths that were caused by texting while driving in those two years. So, because of all these reasons, mind wandering has become an increasingly prominent topic of study within fields like cognitive psychology and neuroscience. And the approach that researchers have been using to studying mind wandering is looking at fMRI noise. So, an fMRI is a neuroimaging machine that picks up on increases or decreases of blood flow to certain areas of the brain in response to experimental stimuli. These changes in blood flow can then point to changes in activation of these different brain regions. Um, and so, basically, whenever a scientist is, co is conducting any kind of behavioral fMRI study, the goal would always be to minimize experiment-unrelated brain activity, because this would be constituted as experimental noise, and would prevent the researchers from getting as useful data as they could possibly get. So the way that they went about minimizing this was to first look at brain activity during resting periods, or periods during which the participant isn't doing any kind of experimental task. They would then take this activity and use it as a baseline for any kind of results that they would have obtained. But what they started realizing was that during these baseline periods, there were certain brain regions that were consistently being activated. And not only that, but they were consistently staying activated up until the point that the participant actually began the experiment. These set of regions became known as the default network, which we're going to talk about a bit more in a second. But also, it's important that you take everything that we discussed today with a grain of salt, because there are a lot of factors that can contribute to the production of fMRI noise. One of them being when data is actually processed by the software of these machines, this also can add on some extra background noise. Um, and also, as with any fMRI study, because the subject is a human, there's a ton of variables that you have to control that could uh, 
that could produce a response in a brain region that's not related to the study. So just take everything that we talk about today with an understanding that there could be some flaws. So another difficulty that of studying mind wandering is actually defining it. So the definition that scientists have been using is task or stimulus unrelated brain activity or thought. So for example, if someone's talking to you, but instead of listening, you're thinking about the essay that's your next period. And this makes sense. But simply saying that you're thinking about something off topic tells us nothing about the dynamics of this thought process. In other words, how did this mental state come about and how can it change over time? And so this is where the paper that I'm going to discuss today comes in. Basically, the goal of this paper was to take a step back from this definition that we have of mind wandering as simply meaning the opposite of what a certain experiment is asking you to do, and let's instead look at the mechanics that allow the spontaneous shift in attention to happen. So, when considering dynamics of thought, we have to look at two things, constraints and orientation. So this paper defines mind wandering as a spontaneous thought, meaning that it occurs due to a lack of constraints. And a thought constraint is basically just what keeps us from mind wandering or what refocuses us on the present. And there exists two basic thought constraint systems. There's deliberate and automatic. So deliberate thought constraints are put into effect through conscious cognitive control. And a good example of this would be kind of like when you have to force yourself to read a book even though you find it really, really boring. Um, on the other hand, automatic thought constraints occur involuntarily. So an example of this would be you trying to study in the library but not being able to take your attention away from this fly that's buzzing in your ear. And actually, this analogy is a really good example of why this old definition of mind wandering is flawed. Because with the example of the fly, you're technically thinking about something that's off topic. You're not focused on the right thing. But because your shifted attention didn't occur spontaneously, your mind isn't actually wandering. Like, in other words, the fly is what triggered you to change your focus. Another thing that we have to consider is the orientation of thought. So is it an externally oriented thought, which projects the way that a person would interact with the outside environment? Or is it an internally oriented thought, focused on self? So right now, there is a consensus amongst the researchers in this field about the brain networks that are responsible for these four processes. And they are the default network, or the DN, the dorsal attention network, or the DAN, the frontal parietal control network, FPCN, and the cingulo opercular control network, COCN, and the salience network and ventral attention network, or VAN. Are there any questions so far? No? Okay. So, the default network, or the DN, like we mentioned before, was originally identified as the set of regions that were consistently activated during periods of experimental rest and then, active, and then consistently deactivated during once the participant turned their focus onto the experiment. And so the DN is divided into three subsystems, the DN core, the DN MTO, and the DN sub three. And these three systems interact during internal thought processing. So this would include thoughts like, I'm hungry, or I really want some coffee. On the other hand, the dorsal attention network, or the DAN, is recruited once we turn our attention towards the external environment. It allows us to perceive sensory features around us and then use this sensory information to connect them to motor responses. So this would include thoughts like, the sky is blue, the music is too loud, or wow, the stovetop is really hot, I should probably move my hand. And so, as our thoughts and attention shift between internal and external focus, um, there's also an observable shift in DN and DAN recruitment. But what causes this shift? Well, one way 
that your thoughts can be triggered to shift between external and internal orientation is automatically through automatically when you perceive that something is salient. And so something is salient when it stands out, basically, for one reason or another. Either it's too loud or it's brightly colored against a dull background. And as a survival instinct, once we perceive that something is so out of the ordinary, our attention is automatically reoriented onto it. So, so the salience network is in charge of detecting the salient stimuli, and the ventral attention network is in charge of the automatic reorientation of our attention. And so this would be the mechanism by which you're drawn to the loud fly in the quiet library. Finally, shifts in attention can occur through deliberate cognitive control. And so the brain networks associated with this are the frontal parietal control network, or the FPCN, and the cingulo opercular control network, or the COCN. And so both of these regions are specifically involved with what is called goal-directed thought. And they can pair with either the DN to produce internal goal-directed thought, or with the DAN to produce external goal-directed thought. So this would be the difference between something like autobiographical planning and visual spatial planning. So the difference between I really have to read this book so that one day I can become a lawyer versus literally my next step is going to be in the left direction. So just as a recap, I'm going to show you guys a brain network and you guys tell me uh, what orientation or constraint it's associated with. So default network. Internal thoughts? Yep. That's right. Um, dorsal attention network. Over here. External thoughts? Yep. Um, <laughs> and then salience network or ventral attention network? Yep. A shift between the internal orientation versus external orientation because of the salient um, trigger. Right. And then Frontal parietal control network and singular curricular control network. Anyway. Ten minutes. Okay. Yeah. Deliberate. Yeah. Exactly. So. <laughs> so, again, it's important to realize that these networks only represent the current consensus on the matter. That this is still very much a developing topic and that the precise boundaries of a lot of these networks are still up for discussion. But, interestingly, a lot, recently, a lot of these networks have become increasingly relevant in research related to psychiatric disorders like depression. And this is because we see certain abnormalities within these networks in depressed individuals that seem to correlate with a lot of depressive symptoms. So, Depression, we know, is a psychiatric disorder associated with excessive stability on specifically negative thoughts. And a hallmark of depression is rumination, which is just that. So repetitive, involuntary fixation on negative thoughts related to the self. Um, and what we've seen is that in comparison to healthy controls, depressed individuals, on average, show an overactivated DM an overactivated salience network, decreased <coughs> levels within the FPCN, and a higher level of interaction between the FPCN and the DN, and a lower amount of interaction between the FPCN and the DAN. So this becomes interesting because, like I said, a lot of these abnormalities correlate to the constraints and orientation of depressive thoughts. For example, the overactivation of the default network would point to the self-focused nature of a lot of these depressive thoughts. Um, the overactivated salience network and decreased level of FPCN activation would point to the involuntary nature of depressive thoughts. So basically too much of an emphasis on automatic constraints versus an inability for our deliberate thought constraint mechanisms to 
bring us back. Um, and then also, the increased amount of FPCN interaction with the DN would, again, is pointing towards this fixation on internal thoughts and the decreased amount of FPCN interaction with the DAN points to the inability to disengage from the internal thoughts and deliberately bring the depressed individual back towards the external world. So, kind of a discussion question that I want you guys to think about is, considering that there are such pros and cons of mind wandering and the mechanisms uh, involved with mind wandering, is this necessarily a process that we even want to tamper with or change in any way? Does anyone have any thoughts on that? Well, I think that it's interesting like, to think about looking into it with like, something like depression where it's somebody has like something that could potentially be helped, but then at the same time, like, is it something, like, it's such a natural process that you wonder how, like, tampering with it could change things. It's also weird because we're on, like, a frontier, but at the same time, there's been, like, there's been so many other things that like, seem like, why should we bother with this It's a natural process? And in hindsight, we know, oh, it was good to treat that, so I wonder if it's the same thing happening now. Yeah. Uh, I think you were saying that because it's something that's related to the brain, potentially making a mistake could have really detrimental effects. I don't know if this is in the paper, but it'd be interesting um, to consider that every every psychoactive compound in some way, you know, whether it's medicine that you take for depression or AET or caffeine or a drug or something, is going to change the way these networks interact with each other already. Um, so it'd be interesting to know um, how the how the balance is shifting with some of these medications. Because um, we actually are already tampering with these things all the time, <laughs> even though we don't know how to do it. Sugar and cheese. Sugar and cheese. Mm -hmm. My favorites. <laughs> okay. And so then, the final thought that I kind of want to leave you with is that it's not all bad. That science does say that we do at least have a little bit of deliberate control over our thoughts and over our mind wandering. So, Maybe it really is just that last second to fully focus yourself on the present and put yourself in the moment that can have all the effect on the way that you feel throughout your day. Thank you.